A Karen at my school food fair accuses me of using drugs when I desperately needed my EpiPen for an allergic reaction. She ends up breaking it and laughs it off, but little did she know the consequences of her reckless actions. Here's what happened. So it was food fair day in my school, the one day in the year where the school got together and everyone brought in food from their respective cultures to share. A fantastic day of culinary exploration, interrupted only by the occasional bout of food poisoning. So I'm a 16-year-old guy with an average build, a bit on the skinny side, and I have an ungodly metabolism that requires a steady influx of food to keep me upright. There was just one minor complication. I'm allergic to tree nuts. Not deathly so, but enough that it could land me in the hospital if I'm not careful. I had my trusty EpiPen by my side, but I was hoping not to use it. The food stalls were a sight to behold, a kaleidoscope of colors and smells that made my stomach rumble in anticipation. As I wandered around sampling this and that, my eyes fell on a stall with an array of Mediterranean desserts. I'm a sucker for sweet things, and before I knew it, I had grabbed a piece of baklava. The first bite was divine, a symphony of honey, phyllo, and something else. That something else hit me with the force of a freight train. Nuts, tree nuts. I could feel the familiar itchiness creeping up my throat, and I knew I was in trouble. I fumbled for my EpiPen when a sharp voice interrupted me. What are you doing, young man? Mrs. Karen, my math teacher, who earned her nickname for her uncanny resemblance to every entitled parent meme on the internet, was glaring at me. She had a reputation for being a stickler, but this was a new level even for her. Mrs. Karen, I croaked out, I need to use this. I'm having an allergic reaction. She snatched the EpiPen from my hand, squinting at it suspiciously. This looks like a drug. Are you trying to use drugs in school? What? No, it's an EpiPen. I need it for... Save your lies. She cut me off with a derisive snort. I know what you kids do for drugs these days. I'm taking you to the principal's office. You've got to be kidding me, I said, my throat itching even more. Mrs. Karen started walking away, but I couldn't let her take my EpiPen. I ran after her, but my throat was closing up. The world started to blur at the edges, and I was gasping for air. I managed to grab her hand, and in the ensuing struggle, the EpiPen hit the floor, shattering into pieces. I stared at the broken EpiPen, a cold dread washing over me. Are you insane? I screamed, my voice raspy. I needed that! But Mrs. Karen just laughed, oblivious to my panic. Sure you did, she said, sarcasm dripping from her voice. I've heard better excuses. There I was, looking at the shattered EpiPen on the ground, a mix of panic and anger boiling inside me. You've got to be freaking kidding me, I wheezed out, barely able to keep myself upright. Mrs. Karen just smirked, triumph sparkling in her eyes. You can't fool me, young man. Mrs. Karen, I swear if I don't get to a hospital, I'll... I didn't finish the sentence, but the sentiment was clear. I was desperate and needed help. A bystander student named Jack stepped in. Dude, he's not faking it. I've seen him have a reaction before. It's an EpiPen, not drugs. Mrs. Karen looked at him, then back at me, and her smirk wavered a little. Well, he can explain it to the principal then, she said, grabbing my arm to drag me to the office. No, he can't, Jack said, firmly pulling my arm away from Mrs. Karen. Because if we don't call an ambulance right now, he might not be able to explain anything to anyone. Mrs. Karen scoffed. I'm not going to be threatened by some teenager. It's not a threat. It's a fact, Jack said, pulling out his phone and dialing 911. With the help of Jack and some friends, I was able to make it through the next half hour, my symptoms slowly worsening, but not to the point of unconsciousness. We managed to grab another EpiPen from the school nurse who was thankfully nearby, just as the ambulance arrived. The aftermath was a whirlwind of hospital checks, worried parents, and heated discussions with the school board. My parents were livid, demanding immediate action against Mrs. Karen. Karen. After an investigation where multiple witnesses came forward, including Jack, the school board concluded that Mrs. Karen's actions were reckless and jeopardized my safety. She was promptly fired. She tried to argue her case, spinning a tale about her crusade against drug use in school, but it was clear to everyone that she had been in the wrong. Her dismissal was a small victory, but it didn't erase the trauma of the day. From then on I was always careful at food fairs and I always carried two EpiPens just in case one turned out not to be enough. Whoa, OP, this story is just a wild ride from start to finish. Can you believe the nerve of this Karen? She straight up accused OP of drug use in the middle of an allergic reaction. It's like, hello, that's an EpiPen, not a joint. Then she laughs off breaking the EpiPen. I mean, I've heard of Karens being entitled, but this takes it to a whole new level of crazy. This could have ended way worse if it weren't for quick thinking Jack. I mean, Jack for the win, am I right? And when the school board actually fires her? Man, talk about sweet, sweet karma. But honestly, it's really terrifying to think about what could have happened. It's like she was living in her own reality completely disconnected from the seriousness of the situation. Now, OP always carries two EpiPens. Can't blame him for that. It's scary that it had to come to this. But hey, better safe than sorry.
A Karen and her entitled kid move into my apartment complex, turning the peaceful yard into a minefield of their tiny dog's droppings. When confronted, they escalate their audacity, hijacking my pet supplies and invading my personal space. But they didn't anticipate my readiness to fight back. Here's what happened. So this happened at the last apartment complex I lived in. My significant other and I were renting a ground floor unit at a really nice apartment complex. I wouldn't say it was a luxury apartment or anything, but our ground floor unit had a little patio off the back that led out into a really nice courtyard area with hammocks, a walking path, outdoor fireplace slash seating area, etc. A lot of people walk their dogs out there or let their kids play out in the grass, including us. We have a one-year-old cane corso. We got her when we'd been living in the unit for about 2.5 months and she was only 8 weeks at the time. She's a really good dog and we trained her well. We could let her out to go potty and she'd come right back even if there were distractions slash people slash dogs out. We always stood on the patio and watched her anyways because our pet agreement said we couldn't leave our dog unattended. Then we'd go pick up her poop right away if she pooped, also part of the pet agreement as I'm sure is standard at most apartment complexes. We kept a small step trash can outside specifically for her poop bags because we didn't want to throw them away inside, and the only outside trash cans were on the other side of the building, which I agree is super dumb. It really was a small trash can, like the kind you'd tuck into the bathroom between the toilet and the wall. We also had her poop bags hanging on our patio door handle for easy access, so we didn't have to hunt for them every time we needed them. Karen and her entitled kid moved in on the ground floor in our building, two units down from us. No biggie. We ran into her one day carrying in groceries and my SO held open the door for her. She seemed kind of Karenish, but was polite, and her kid, probably 10, 11 years old, didn't look up from his phone. Whatever that's pretty typical of kids these days. They also had a dog, a little black and white fluffy thing, super cute, but not trained very well. Don't know what kind of dog, but it was much smaller than our already giant puppy. After about two weeks or so, we realized that there were dog turds in the grass right off our patio. We found out the hard way because my boyfriend stepped in it the first time. Luckily, he wasn't barefoot. They were clearly not our dog's turds as one. We always picked up her poop right after she went in two. They were very obviously from a small dog, not our 70-pound puppy. We'd been in the apartment about seven, eight months at that point and had never had an issue with this, so we figured it was Karen's little dog. I wrote her a polite note that basically was like, Hey neighbor, we noticed that some of your dog's poops aren't being picked up and are right off our patio. Per the pet agreement we all have to sign, we all need to be picking up our own dog's poop each time they go. I'm sure it was an accident and you just didn't notice, so if you could make sure to do that going forward, we'd appreciate it. Your neighbor's in unit number. She wasn't home, so I slipped it under the door and went back to my apartment. A couple hours later, Karen is banging on my door and gets really angry with me, insists that it couldn't have been her dog, and how dare I assume. I felt really bad, and I apologized immediately, said I didn't mean to offend her, and it must have been someone else. She told me never to bother her with crap like this again, and stormed off. I was like, okay. Not three days later, I was sitting on my patio with a book enjoying the cool weather when I see their little dog run out of their back door, no one with it, and it comes over to me. I said hello to the pup, beast use I love pups, and then it took a shit right off patio, ran back home and scratched the door to be let in. I saw the kid slide the door open enough to let the dog in, and then closed it again without coming outside to pick up the poop. I was annoyed, because here I saw it with my own eyes that it was their dog, and no one was even watching it when it was outside. So I grabbed a poop bag, picked up the poop, wrote another less polite note about Karen's kid neglecting to watch the dog or come to check if it had pooped slash pick up after it, and dropped the poop bag and the note on their patio right by the door, then went back to my reading. Karen was quicker to come by this time and stomped right up to me, waving the note around, then stated that her kid was just a kid and probably just forgot to check. I said I didn't care, her kid was old enough to stand outside for three minutes and come pick up the dog's poop. She said, well there's no poop bags, trash cans on this side of the building and she didn't feel comfortable making her kid walk all the way around the building for that. The next part is my own fault, in hindsight. I suggested she put a trash can like mine on her patio and leave their own poop bags handy like we do for our dog. She eyed our stuff, huffed some more, rolled her eyes, refused to do anything about the poop and walked off. At this point, I was super annoyed. I stalked my patio door for the next couple days as much as I could, just waiting. And sure enough, on day two in the evening when I was about to give up, I see the puppy run outside towards my patio. I whipped out my phone, took some pictures of the dog outside alone, 
not allowed, and the dog pooping, and then took another phone an hour later of the poop still there, and time stamped all of them. Then I sent an email to the apartment office people who were always pretty nice, and they responded quickly they would give Karen a warning about it. And sure enough, Karen comes back again, to get mad and yell at me about how petty I was to report them to the office, and now they had a dollar one hundred fifty fine for not picking up their dog poop. It's worth noting that these fines were rare. Poop prints were not used at this complex. In order for the office to find someone for dog poop, they had to have proof it was that specific tenant's dog's poop and that it wasn't picked up. Hence the photos I'd taken and time stamped. I told her that I had tried to be nice about it with her twice before, and it was her own fault at that point for not abiding by the terms of the pet agreement we all had to sign, everyone who had a dog at least. She went off about how she's a single mom and she works during the day and her precious baby can't be expected to pick up after their dog. I told her that a 10-11 year old was plenty old enough to pick up after a dog and that if they weren't responsible enough then maybe the kid shouldn't be letting the dog out at all and she should be the one to do it and maybe whoever is home with him should be looking after it. She got angry, told me I had no idea how to be a single mom, that her mom stays with him during the day and shouldn't be expected to look after her kid and her dog and she stomped off again. I expected to hear more about it but I didn't. The ironic part is I am a single mom. My kid isn't my SO's and I raised him alone for 2.5 years before I met my SO so yes I do know how hard it is and I live 1,000 miles from my closest family so I never even had the luxury of being able to have my mom watch my kid. Over the next couple of weeks we didn't find any more dog turds off our patio but we did notice our poop bags were depleting and our trash can filling up way more quickly than usual. I had my suspicions and wanted to test it. We had recently bought some small security cameras for inside of our apartment for different reasons and I had my boyfriend set one up outside on the patio. We faced it where it could see our door and trash can but didn't point to the rest of the courtyard or other people's units. We respect privacy around here. Sure enough, the same evening my boyfriend set it up, I see the kid walk onto our patio, take a poop bag, walk out of frame, and then come back to throw it in our trash can. Okay, now I'm pissed, but also not trying to fight this lady or her kid. So I move the poop bags to the inside door handle. It's a glass door so you can still see them, but we always lock our sliding door. Next morning, I hear someone knocking on the back patio door, and I go to see the kid standing there looking annoyed. I didn't open the door, I just spoke loudly enough to ask what did he need. He demanded a poop bag for his dog's poop. I said I'm sorry but these are our poop bags for our dog and they weren't free for anyone else to use. The apartment provides poop bags in a dispenser near the trash can on the other side of the building. Kid started demanding a poop bag, saying his mom told him he could use ours, slapping his hands on the glass a few times, trying to scare me, yes I'm so terrified of a 10 year old boy, and finally screaming at me that he's telling his mother on me. I said fine, go ahead, I'll tell her the same thing. Sure enough, a few minutes later, Karen is standing on my patio, also demanding a poop bag for her dog's poop. I denied her a bag and asked her to please step off of my patio as she was making me feel unsafe and uncomfortable. My SO wasn't home. She told me I was a bratty child, I'm 24, and she demanded I let her use my poop bags as I had already told her she could before. I said no, I told you to get some yourself and do what I do. Keep them close by and put your own trash can on your own patio. Not use the bags I buy with my own money for my own dog and then fill up my tiny trash can with your dog's poop. I pointed out she could use a plastic shopping bag if she didn't want to buy her own poop bags, or she could use the bags the complex provided on the other side of the building. She kept going off on me, and I finally told her if she didn't leave my patio, I'd call the police as she was harassing me. The apartment office was closed on Sundays and of course it was Sunday. She acted like she was going to call my bluff, but then my boyfriend got home and walked up behind me to ask what was going on, and she ended up dragging her kid away, again, leaving the poop in the grass off my patio. So once she was gone, I took another time-stamped picture of the dog poop, downloaded the footage from my security camera of her kids stealing my poop bags and throwing them in my trash can and the footage from them that morning yelling at me and demanding my bags and my denying them and emailed all of it to the apartment management. I told them that she made me feel unsafe and uncomfortable in my own home, that she and her child felt entitled to come onto my patio and take my belongings. I also went outside, picked up her dog's poop, looked in the trash can on my patio, and pulled out the bags with her dog's poop. They were significantly smaller than my dog's poops, as I'm sure any dog owners could tell the difference in poops of a 12LB dog versus a 70LB dog. I went and opened all the bags and dumped the poops straight on her patio right outside the door. On Monday, I heard back from the office lady who said she would take care of it. By Friday, there was a moving truck and Karen and her kid were moving out, pretty sure they were evicted. After talking to some of our other, much friendlier neighbors, it turns out we weren't the only ones who had been complaining about her. They'd only lived in the complex for like 
like two, three months before they made so many enemies they were kicked out. Sometimes I think I should feel bad for playing a part in them getting evicted but honestly, I can't bring myself to feel guilty about it. Not my fault she was a lazy entitled bitch who couldn't even be asked to get a shopping bag to pick up her dog's shit. I never heard from her about the turds I dropped on her patio, but I like to think she stepped in them without looking and knew better than to come bitch to me about it. OP, you've got the patience of a saint, honestly. I mean, we've all encountered a Karen in the wild, but this one takes the cake. First off, Karen, if you're out there, who leaves dog poop in someone else's backyard? That's not just bad manners, it's a health hazard. And then, the audacity to get mad at OP for pointing it out? I'm over here laughing so hard I can hardly breathe. But oh, it gets crazier. Karen's little bundle of joy sneaking onto OP's patio to steal poop bags? That's next level. And when OP locks up their supplies, both Karen and her kid have the nerve to demand them. I swear, if I were watching this in a movie, I'd say it's too unbelievable. OP, you handled this situation like a champ, using your security cameras, email, and yes, even the ultimate weapon of doggy doo-doo to bring Karen to justice. And in the end, justice was indeed served. Karen, her kid, and their untrained dog were sent packing, leaving the peaceful apartment complex to live happily ever after. A racist Karen of a boss tells me to shave my beard, claiming I look like a terrorist, then threatens my pay when I confront her. But when I take action against her and her colleagues, they get their comeuppance. Here's what happened. I used to work in hospitality in a metro known for its obscenely huge tourist population, you know, the city built around the mouse. I was a manager for the recreational division of the hotel. So one day, my boss, who we'll call Mary for the purpose of the story, comes into the shared manager's office and starts rummaging around for something and strikes up a small conversation about work-related minutia with me. It's important to note she is actually two tiers above me, but was acting as head of the department while searching to replace my previous boss who recently quit. Great guy, by the way. Massive loss to the company. As we're talking, she abruptly stops and says, By the way, you need to shave your beard. You look like a terrorist, and I don't employ terrorists. Haha. <laughs> Funny joke between colleagues, right? Nope. I am half Indian, and I do look Middle Eastern, and have been taking this kind of shit since middle school. Plus, we're not close at all. So I reply as calmly as I can muster, Hey, I get you're trying to be funny, but on my end it comes off as pretty ignorant so I'd appreciate it if you chilled out with the terrorist stuff. To which Mary retorts, Oh, I'm ignorant. We'll see how ignorant I am during your annual review. And proceeds to walk out of the room in a huff. My jaw dropped so low I could taste the floor. You would think it was an easy fix, right? Go to HR and all. She's made rude comments like this before. I've refrained from contacting HR because I didn't want to be petty, but now she threatened my pay, and that's no bueno. So I go to HR like a good boy and tell the HR director, who we'll call Boyd. I explicitly ask him not to mention it to anyone, just to log it away in case someone else reports something similar and he can establish a pattern of behavior. Well, Boyd decided that he simply must talk to Mary about it. I stress again that I am not comfortable with it, since she strikes me as the vindictive type. No good. He promises there will be no retaliation and tells me he'll contact me later for a statement, which I thought was weird. Why not make a statement now? And that was that. About a week goes by and I follow up with Boyd because I've been getting some less than pleasant vibes from Mary. Nothing substantial, but odd. When I ask what happened, he tells me, well, it appears that Mary was just joking, but she has agreed to never say anything like that again. Your annual review is not in jeopardy. Ugh. At that point, I decide to just let it go. Fast forward a month, a new director for our department is hired, and surprise, surprise, it's her roommate and former front desk supervisor, Joe. Okay, cool. I'm used to the nepotism because the entire hotel basically operates that way. Whatever. Never had an issue with him, didn't know him too well, but I'm happy our little hive has a leader again. Man, how fucking naive I was. From the get-go, he is unpleasant. Snide comments left and right, changing my schedule at the last minute every week or scheduling me on my established days off, giving away opportunities to my peers that I'm never considered for, making me take improvement classes none of my peers have to take. All strange, but up to that point, nothing earth-shattering, until one day I get written up out of the blue, first ever write-up BTW, for refusing to inform a superior of leaving the premises, referring to me leaving the day prior without literally saying the words, Hey Joe, I'm leaving for the day. 1. This is not an established policy written or otherwise. When I say I'm leaving, it's a courtesy. 2. I know for a fact my peers don't always say when they leave, personal observation, and was corroborated by them after asking around. And 3. Knowing that my peers aren't held to the same bogus standard and having never been written up for it, I know this is a direct shot at me. My review is fucked. 
Best part? Joe let it slip that Mary asked for me after I left, and when it was found that I was indeed gone, she requested the write-up. That was fuck-up number two, lady. Number three came when Boyd decided to cover his own ass when I approached him with all the evidence pointing to retaliation and discrimination in the workplace. I learned he never properly documented his discussion with me or Mary, and that he's been basically playing the whole fucking thing by ear. I decided to write my long past due statement then and there, turn it in, and email a picture copy to the corporate office. I tell Boyd that I am sorely disappointed about how he handled the issue, and he responds by accusing me of dramatizing the whole ordeal. He was very flippant about the whole thing, rolling his eyes and everything. K, okay, buddy, I see you now. So finally, we've reached the revenge. After some time, I scrounge up all the evidence I can. My write-up, my co-workers' write-up records, with their permission, company policy manuals, my schedules for the past month, including the bogus classes only I was made to attend, my co-workers' schedules, witness statements, from peers when Mary has said other demeaning things, and a few others' items. Next step, I tell off Joe, because fuck him. I make sure he is very angry when I leave. You'll see why later. After crossing my T's and dotting my I's, I resigned with a two-week notice. That night, I type up a letter to the EEOC, the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission, and attach all my evidence. I mention Mary, Boyd, and Joe by first and last name. I hint that I am pondering a lawsuit. A few weeks later, I have my girlfriend call my old job pretending to be a potential employer asking for a reference. I give her the extension to Joe's desk. As I predicted, he slanders the ever-loving shit out of me. Straight up lies, even got my resignation date wrong along with my attendance record, all verifiable, helping my case. I tried the same trick with Boyd, but he was smart enough to point my girlfriend in the direction of a third-party reference dialer the company is supposed to use for these kinds of calls. I proceed to send my old employer, corporate included, a cease and desist letter with a transcript of the call, hinting I may sue for slander. No, here's the result. Some time passes, and the other day I'm at the bank with my girlfriend, I get a call from an old co-worker. I miss the call, but I resign to call him back later. Less than an hour later I get five, six calls and texts informing me that Mary, Joe, and Boyd were all fired the same day and walked out of the building. Mary cried. Apparently the corporate office was contacted by the EEOC and launched their own internal investigation, matching their records with my evidence. The EEOC sent me a return letter with the company's statement, which was fallacious as fuck, due to their interviews with the Three Stooges. But nonetheless I suppose they decided it was easier to nip it in the bud and sack their asses to be safe. Karma may be a bitch, but in this case, she had nothing to fucking do with it. Holy Karen on a cracker! I can't even believe what I just read! OP's story just made me go from 0 to 100 real quick. I can't even begin to imagine what it must feel like to have your boss say that to you. And the fact that HR didn't handle the situation correctly to begin with just made it even worse. And then to have to deal with Joe, who was probably Mary's crony, and all his bullshit write-ups and scheduling shenanigans just takes the cake. The retaliation and discrimination in the workplace are just unacceptable. And it's no wonder OP decided to take matters into their own hands. But the ending though, OMG. I had to take a moment to process that they all got fired on the same day. Justice served. It just goes to show that you can't get away with treating people like crap and playing favorites. I wonder what the viewers think of this insane situation. Have any of you ever been in a similar situation? Let me know in the comments below. A Karen accuses me of being a terrorist after confusing my innocent science project for a bomb during science fair at my high school. Police were called. Here's what happened. So, I'm a 16-year-old high school student, and I've always had a passion for science. Ever since I was a kid, I was fascinated by the way things worked and how I could use my knowledge to create something new and exciting. So, when the annual science fair came around this year, I was more than ready to showcase my latest creation, a robot. I had been working on the robot for months, and I was so proud of what I had accomplished. It was a basic robot that could move around and take pictures. It could be controlled through a basic phone app. I had spent countless hours programming the robot, making sure it was able to move and respond to different commands. So, on the day of the science fair, I was more than ready to show off my robot. I set it up on my table, and I was ready to answer any questions that the judges or other students might have. I was confident that my project was going to do well, and I was hoping to win first place. But my hopes were slowly shattered when a casual teacher, who was one of the judges, approached my table. She was a woman in her 50s and had a noticeable stern expression. She introduced herself, who we'll call Karen, and she didn't look too pleased to see me. Excuse me, young man, but what is that? The woman asked. I turned around to see her standing there and answered, It's a robot, thinking it was just an innocent question of curiosity. A robot? She said, sounding skeptical. What kind of robot is it? It's a robot that can move and respond to its environment, I said, trying to keep my voice calm. I built it from scratch, and I'm really proud of it. Mm. 
she said, still sounding suspicious. Are you sure it's safe? Of course it's safe. Why wouldn't it be? I replied, starting to feel annoyed. It's not going to hurt anyone. The woman looked at me for a moment, then nodded. Okay, I'll take your word for it. But if there are any problems, I'll be right over here. I wanted to say something, but I didn't want to cause a scene. So I just smiled and nodded and went back to setting up my booth. As the science fair got underway, I started to feel a bit more at ease after that strange encounter. People were stopping by my booth, asking questions and admiring my robot. I was really proud of my work and I was having a great time. But then, the woman from before came back. Excuse me, young man, she said, but we have some concerns about your project. Could you talk with me, please? I felt my heart sink. What do you mean? I asked, trying to keep my voice steady. I just need to ask you a few questions, that's all, the woman said. It won't take long. So, where did you get the materials for this project? She asked. I got them from a hobby store. Why? I replied. And how did you learn how to build a robot? The woman asked. I taught myself from the internet, I said. I've been interested in science and technology for a long time. But as I spoke, Karen's expression grew increasingly skeptical. She asked me a few more questions, but she seemed more interested in where I was from and what my religion was. I was taken aback by her sudden shift in focus, but I tried to stay polite and answer her questions. I'm Muslim, I said, hoping to steer the conversation back to my project. But why are you asking? She ignored me and started to ask me more and more questions about my religion, and she started to make comments about how suspicious my robot looked. I started to feel like she was implying that I was a threat because of my background, and I was starting to feel really, really uncomfortable. Excuse me, I said, trying to keep my voice steady. But what does my religion have to do with my science project? I don't understand why you're asking me all these questions. Karen just looked at me with a tight-lipped smile. I'm just trying to make sure that your project is safe, she said, in a tone that was anything but reassuring. You think this is a bomb, don't you? I don't know what it is, she said, starting to sound panicked. But I have to take every precaution. You need to tell me what it is. I tried to explain that it was just a robot, but the woman wasn't listening. Karen's demeanor changed, and she started to look around the room, as if she were searching for something. Then, without any warning, she suddenly shouted, Everyone evacuate the room! There's a bomb in here! An awkward silence occurred, and as I looked around, I saw almost everyone running for the door, and some just standing there frozen panicking and scared. I looked back at Karen, and she was still shouting, pointing at my table. That's the bomb right there, she screamed. Everyone get out! It's a terrorist plot! My heart was pounding in my chest as I realized what was happening. I quickly turned and ran straight to the principal's office. I was so scared and didn't know what else to do. I burst into her office and tried to explain what had just happened. But she was completely clueless and was wondering why all the kids were screaming. She asked me what was going on, and I explained it was my science project. One of the judges mistook it for a bomb and caused a panic. But it's not a bomb. It's just a robot I built for the science fair. The principal listened to my explanation and immediately sided with me. The principal knew me well from before and knew I was saying the truth, and she was horrified by Karen's accusations. She quickly took charge of the situation, calling for calm and order. Within about 10 minutes, police arrived on the scene, and the principal explained the situation to them. The police were skeptical at first, but they decided to investigate the supposed bomb threat just to make sure it wasn't a valid one. I remember the moment when the police officers entered the room where my project was on display. I was so nervous, but I tried to remain calm and explain to them what had happened. I showed them my robot, and I explained that it was just a simple robot for science. The police officers were very thorough in their investigation, but they soon realized that Karen's accusations were baseless. They found no evidence of any threat, and they quickly cleared the scene. I was so relieved when they told me that I was free to go and that my project was safe. It turned out a couple of students had called the police after hearing Karen's accusations. After the police cleared the scene, the principal called me and Karen into her office to discuss what had just happened. The principal told Karen how serious her actions were and how they affected me and the school community. But Karen didn't seem sorry at all. She said that she was just following protocol and that she had to take all threats seriously. The principal wasn't having it, though. She saw Karen's actions as a clear case of racial profiling and decided to let her go as a teacher at the school. News of Karen's firing spread quickly through the school, and a lot of students and staff showed their support for me. In the end, the science fair was rescheduled for the next week, and I was able to place first. Wow, this story that OP shared is just insane.
I can't believe what this Karen lady did to OP at the science fair, accusing a student of being a terrorist just because of their religion and mistaking a science project for a bomb? That's just crazy. It reminds me of the Ahmed clock incident in 2015, where a high school student was wrongly accused of bringing a bomb to school because his teacher thought his homemade clock looked suspicious. To be honest, I was kind of hoping this story was fake because this is just really messed up. It's so disheartening to see that these kind of things are still happening in today's society. OP, I'm so sorry you had to go through that. You're obviously an incredibly talented and intelligent person, and your project was amazing. I can't imagine how hard it must have been for you to have to deal with all of that. What do you guys think of this situation? A Karen mother sues my youth sports league because we require a doctor's letter to clear injured players for return. But what she reveals about her son's injury treatment leaves me shocked and speechless. Here's what happened. So I'm a youth sports coach, and whatever stories you've heard about insane parents, it can be even worse than that. I'm in a league where parents are already planning out their kids' target colleges before they can walk. But most of the kids are completely average, because that's what average means, and because other schools have the luxury of players who want to participate. I have kids who were pressured into the game by mom and dad, so don't bring the same heart to the field. It makes it quite difficult to read them. For example, I only just got free of a dispute that's been ongoing for over three months. A sweet but clumsy sophomore who has fun with his teammates but is overall completely indifferent to the sport was out indefinitely with a serious rotator cuff injury. He'd had surgery. He was still sitting in on practices at his parents' insistence, but by no means was he taking a step in the direction of the field. He never complained or protested like my diehard kids who want to be here do, often to their own detriment. He was just as happy to sit playing video games. Great. The best player you can hope for is one who doesn't rush recovery. I was proud of and relieved by how he was handling things. So one day, not even three weeks after his surgery, his mom shows up and says, All right, my son's cleared to play. He can start back today. Maybe someone should take some time to work with him one-on-one -on -one to get him caught up. Hmm? I was surprised, but I'm not a doctor, so if they cleared him, he's clear. But as is protocol, I asked for an official letter from the medical office approving him to return to practice for the team's files. His mom was flabbergasted. I don't have it with me. Who carries that around? It hadn't even occurred to me she might be doing something so brazen and reckless as what she was so... Without skipping a beat, I cheerfully said, No worries. He can hang with us while you run home and fax or email it to me. She stuttered for a second and finally came up with, I don't have time to go all the way home. I have another appointment. It was then that I noticed her son was looking kind of uncomfortable throughout all this. And while he isn't our most enthusiastic guy, I would have still expected him to be psyched to return to practice after sitting patiently on the sidelines for such a long hiatus. So, while I might have agreed to wait to the next day to see the letter in any other case, knowing the player would start back by easing in very slowly regardless, I knew this time I had to see written proof before so much as giving the kid a light stretch routine. I told mom, so I'll just give his doctor's office a call and they can send the letter to us. It's still early we can catch them if we call right now. And stood there, expectantly, waiting for her to call. She gasped and stuttered some more before finally blurting out, He isn't being treated by a Western Big Pharma doctor. He's on an essential oil regimen. I didn't know whether to laugh or start shouting. It was so ridiculous that she was even positing treating an internal injury with essential oils. But even more so infuriating that she would risk her son's health just to get him back in practice a few weeks early. I couldn't tell straight away if she genuinely thought the oils had healed his shoulder, which still visibly appeared to be causing him pain, or if she was just saying that to try and get out of producing the letter she didn't have because he was seeing a doctor who had not cleared him yet. I was stuck at that point and called another coach over to confer privately. After giving her a rundown of the situation, she suggested a foolproof plan. I returned to the boy's mother and said, So I just talked with some other members of the staff and I have great news. The team physician can do a routine post-op exam right now and write a letter. Thankfully, she didn't call my bluff because while we do have a team physician, you have to make appointments with him a week or more in advance. So his mother says she isn't comfortable with him seeing a strange doctor. I reiterate, this is our team physician, who has assisted her son whenever he's been injured on the field. Not a stranger to him. She pivoted back to not trusting Western medicine and wanting to maintain the essential oils plan. She started going off about how all these scans are going to give him radiation poisoning, etc. So I told her I couldn't help her and sent her on her way. Her son was mouthing, sorry coach to me, as she gave her speech and I knew then that I had done the right thing. You could see in his eyes he did not have anything to do with this scheme to rush back on the field. She stormed off absolutely irate, cursing me and even some players from her own son's team who passed her on the way out 
and continued making a scene in the front until someone from marching band practice asked her to leave because they literally could not hear all of the instruments with the way she was carrying on. Not even 24 hours later, the principal and head of athletics each had letters from a law firm accusing us of discriminating against her son, preventing him from playing because of the family's belief in alternative medicine. To be abundantly clear, a shoulder injury is very serious, especially at her son's age. If he didn't do the proper steps for recovery, he could be stuck with a lifetime of pain and not just never play sports again, but never lift anything or hold basic positions without mind-bending pain. Not to mention the potentially permanent mobility problems were he to re-injure himself by playing contact sports while hurt. So, in short, this was a matter of way more than jostling for authority with a parent or personal views about healthcare. It was an issue of my player's physical safety and a hill I was more than willing to die on. I was prepared to go out of my own pocket for a lawyer and say all of that in court if need be. I was in no position to do so financially, but I didn't care. Like I said, I would die on this hill. The principal showed the letter to his lawyer wife, who suggested we just ignore it and see if the kid's mom would just tire of investing time and money into the situation. I know what you're thinking, and you're exactly right. She was not going down that easy. She was back with the lawyer in person at a practice the following week. He tried to tell me something about how, as a team at public school, I could not prevent her son from participating because of the family's personal beliefs and every child had a right to do public school activities. Well, I couldn't be further from a lawyer, but that was still easy even for me. Guy, this is a tryout team. No one is guaranteed participation, and I can cut players for any reason I see fit. That stymied him, and I think he told the boy's mother that she was out of options. But I guess she kept sending him checks because he kept writing us letters, out of an abundance of caution, since you never know how far a crazy person is willing to take a thing like this, or how much money she had to pursue the issue. I had a consult with an attorney of my own. I gave her all of the documents to review, and once she was finished laughing uncontrollably, she told me not to think twice about this and to only come back if I was served with actual papers to appear in court. Six weeks later, I was back in her office. The boy's mother was bringing the school into a civil suit, and I had been called to testify. I met with the lawyer, and I'm lucky she was so honest. She told me the district would probably have counsel for me and to wait before cutting her any checks. She was right. So I was in a big harried meeting preparing for this case. All of the team boosters were there, top administrators I'd only ever heard the name of but never seen in person, and even more people still, who I've already forgotten because these meetings were such a stressful blur. It was getting very serious very quickly. More than once, I was pulled aside by someone with more important places to be and asked if I couldn't just clear the kid to play. By the time things began to wrap up, I was making good and frequent use of that Randy Jackson meme. Yeah, that's gonna be a no for me, dog. We were about a week and a half out from the first official court date and in serious discussions with the school's counsel about actually just buying these people off of the team and settling out of court if they agreed to walk away from the sport and drop the issue. No one wanted to hear me explain all the reasons why that would never work. I was just leaving a smaller one of these strategy meetings when I saw the kid loitering outside of my office. I knew I wasn't supposed to speak to any of them, but the kid had been really cool throughout the whole ordeal, and he definitely wished he wasn't associated with any of his mom's wild antics. So I cautiously approached, and before I could even say anything, the kid drags his dad out from around a corner. His dad seemed concerned his wife might drop out of a ceiling grate or something, but his son was determined and prodded him going, Do it, let's go. His dad, keeping his head on a constant swivel, quietly said, I understand you can have my son cleared by a team physician. I nodded, and the dad hesitated, but the son was clearly fed up and, staring daggers at man, goes, Okay then, let's get fucking going. Sign what you need to sign for me to see who I need to see. My guess is, he didn't want to be known as the player who had testified against his team, because parents are chatty, and everyone at school definitely knew about what was going on. The poor henpecked guy kept saying, quietly enough that his son couldn't hear, Listen, if my wife ever found out about this, holy hell, can you please just not make a big scene with it? Just say he was cleared to play. No need to advertise how it happened, okay? I assured him that not only would I never advertise a student's private business for social clout, but that when it came to medical issues, I was legally prohibited from sharing information with anyone. So I sent one of the only messages flagged urgent that I have ever had to direct to our team doctor, and by the end of the day, our highly relieved strategy team was able to place a call informing the mother that her son was cleared to return to practice. Now don't get it twisted. I didn't ram his recovery paperwork through a back channel to end the suit or alleviate pressure from the administration. His mom had dragged this whole ordeal out so long that he'd actually fully healed. Our doctor was able to pass him with flying colors. She still isn't the worst parent I've had to deal with hostility-wise, but certainly the most serious matter. 
Other people get into it with us over playing time or game schedules or even their kid's uniform number. This is the only one I can remember being this negligent with her son's physical well-being, so it will always rank highest as my worst parent experience. It was just finally confirmed that I am 100% free of all the legal brouhaha so I can gleefully share the story, with strangers at least. Don't want to put the kid on blast in our tiny community, but do want to vent to a whole bunch of people. So, everyone play safe out there. Wow, this Karen takes the cake for being the ultimate crazy sports mom. I mean, suing the school for requiring a letter from a doctor to clear her son for return to play? That's a new level of insanity. And then to top it off, treating a serious injury with essential oils? Like, come on, man, that's just crazy talk. I can't imagine what was going through her mind. But what's even crazier is that she was actually trying to convince the coach to let her son play without the proper clearance from a doctor. Thank goodness the coach was smart enough to know better and called in a team physician for a post-op exam. This just goes to show that some parents will do anything to get their kids ahead, even if it means putting their health at risk. What do you guys think of this absurd situation? Let me know in the comments. A Karen teacher tries to confiscate my insulin pump, which is a medical device I need to survive, because she believes it's a phone. Even though I explained it's a medical device, she then ends up ripping the device right off my body. So I slapped her face and got her ass fired. Here's what happened. I'm a 17-year-old high school student, and I've been living with type 1 diabetes for as long as I can remember. For those of you who don't know, type 1 diabetes is a chronic condition that affects the way my body processes sugar. Basically, my pancreas doesn't produce insulin, which is a hormone that regulates blood sugar levels. So I need to take insulin every day to stay alive. Now, there are a few different ways to take insulin, but for me, the best way is through an insulin pump. It's a small device that I wear on my body, and it's connected to me through a cannula. The pump delivers insulin into my body throughout the day and night, keeping my blood sugar levels in check. It's kind of like a phone, but it's not a phone. It's a medical device, and it's essential to my survival. So, one day, I was in school, and it was recess. I just finished class and was feeling a bit peckish, so I went to the school canteen to grab some food. Before I ate, I had to dose insulin through my pump like I always do. I try to do this discreetly because I don't like having to explain myself to people. But this time, there was a new teacher on duty during recess, and she saw me. She was a Karen, you could tell. So, my school has a no-phones policy. Students are required to hand it in before school starts. So this Karen marched over to me, demanding that I give her my phone. I was a bit confused, so I said, What do you mean? I don't have my phone. And she was like, No, that thing you're holding. Give it to me now, or you're getting a detention. And I was like, Oh, that's not a phone. It's an insulin pump. And I smiled, but she wasn't having it. An insulin pump? She said with a sneer. I've never seen one of those before. Are you sure that's what it is? I tried to stay calm but her tone was starting to get to me. Yes, it's an insulin pump. I have type 1 diabetes and I need it to regulate my blood sugar levels. She raised an eyebrow and crossed her arms. You expect me to believe that? I've never heard of a diabetes pump that looks like a phone before. I think you're just trying to pull a fast one on me. Hand over the phone. I'm not lying, I replied, my voice rising. This is my insulin pump, I swear. Don't lie to me, she said, her voice getting louder. I've been teaching for 20 years and I've seen it all. You're just trying to use your phone in school and that's not allowed. Hand it over. I was getting frustrated and angry. I had never experienced this kind of treatment before, and it was making me feel like I was the one in the wrong. I swear to you, this is my insulin pump. I need it to survive. If you don't believe me, you can ask the nurse or any of my teachers. Oh, I will be asking the nurse, she said, her tone smug. And if I find out you're lying, you'll be facing some serious consequences. Then all of a sudden, she grabbed the insulin pump and ripped it off my body. The cannula came loose, and I was so angry. There was a gasp from the people around us, and I screamed, Fuck no, you stupid bitch! And I smacked her across the face with the back of my hand. She was taken aback by this, so she made a supersonic screech attack and yelled, What the fuck did you do to me? You're getting expelled for this! And she stormed off God knows where. One of the nicer teachers came over and gave me back my insulin pump after snatching it from the Karen, and the bell rang. The nicer teacher took me to the principal's office, saying she was going to get the Karen teacher in trouble. When we got to the principal's office, she explained what had happened. She told the principal that I was caught using my insulin pump by the Karen teacher, and that she had mistaken it for a phone and snatched it out of my hands, even after I had explained to her that it was not a phone. She also explained that the Karen teacher had ripped the insulin pump off my body, causing the cannula to come loose. The principal was horrified when she heard what had happened, 
She couldn't believe that a teacher would mistake an insulin pump for a phone and then grab it and rip it off a student's body. Luckily, not having insulin for a few hours is not life-threatening, so I was able to get picked up from school by my parents. They took me home so I could apply a new cannula to my body. It's a simple procedure, really. My parents were furious about what had happened, and they decided to complain to the school. They were upset that their son had been treated so poorly by a teacher, and they wanted to make sure that it didn't happen to anyone else. The school was super apologetic about what had happened, and they took action. The Karen teacher was fired, and the school decided to cover my fees for a semester as a gesture of apology. They didn't want me to escalate the situation, so my family agreed to accept their offer. Honestly, I feel like I should escalate the situation, but I don't know. What should I have done instead? Wow, this story from the OP is just mind-blowing. I mean, a teacher mistaking an insulin pump for a phone and then snatching it away from a student and ripping it off their body? That is just crazy town, folks. I can't even imagine what the OP must have gone through in that moment. They must have been so frustrated and angry, and I don't blame them for smacking the Karen teacher. That's just absurd. It's good to see that the principal was horrified by what happened and took the OP's side. But the fact that this even happened is just ridiculous. Teachers are supposed to be there to help and support students, not make their lives harder. I'm just glad the OP was able to get home safely and get their insulin pump back up and running. This whole situation just goes to show how important it is to educate people about different medical conditions, especially if they are in a position of authority, like a teacher. What do you guys think of this situation? Let me know in the comments below. An entitled kid tries to steal my tablet with the help of his crazy dad. I caught them and then complained to security, who then prevented me from retrieving my own property. The suspect then decides to destroy my tablet because according to him, if he can't have it, then no one can. So I decided to get some sweet revenge. Here's what happened. My old Kindle, rest in peace, had just died, so I was borrowing my wife's tablet to get my reading fix. I was just chilling out in the cafeteria with a coffee after working a short notice call in for four hours. Because I was shopping when I got the call, I wasn't in uniform. So it's just me in a an old t-shirt and jeans trying to grab a minute to myself before my shift proper kicked off. I was pretty into my ebook when I felt a tug on my elbow. I turned around to find a little Indian, Southeast Asian, not Native American kid, looking at the tablet. He's maybe five to six years old and asks if I have any games on my iPad. It's not an iPad, it's an old Samsung thing. I tell him, no, this is a boring old person tablet. It only has books. While we have our little conversation, I'm looking around for any evidence of parents. Hospitals are big places and kids get lost a lot. He seems disappointed in the game situation and wanders off, and I think nothing of it. A bit later, the five-minute warning goes off on my phone to let me know I need to get back upstairs to the lab. I dash off to the coffee machine for that one last refill and foolishly leave the tablet sitting on my jacket on the table. When I come back, the tablet is gone. I do that thing everyone does where I pat all my pockets and look on the floor, but the damn thing is really gone. I grab my jacket up and head to the counter to see if they saw anything, but on the way, I see the kid from earlier leaving with his mother, and he's got my tablet. I know it's my wife's because the cover is very distinctive, with cartoon characters on it, so I know it's hers. I catch up with them and politely ask if I can have the tablet back. The mother kind of smiles at me, but we have a bit of a language barrier. I do the world's worst performance art miming that the tablet is mine. She talks to the kid who is starting to whine and clutches the tablet to his chest. At this point, I'm thinking this is going to be fine. The mother knows what up. I'm going to get my stuff and all is going to be well. Enter entitled dad. I didn't see him coming. He must have still been at the counter or in one of the booths. The kid had gone from whining to angry crying pretty quick, and suddenly 5'4 of Entitled Dad is there, jabbing a finger at me and yelling in broken English, What are you doing? What are you doing? I tell the guy that his kid has my tablet. I just want it back. He doesn't even look at the kid. He's just yelling, My son is not a thief. You leave. My son is not a thief. You leave. I tell him that I'm happy to leave. Just give me back my property, and I'm gone. I don't raise my voice. My hands are at my sides, and I'm trying to keep things nice. But this guy is getting revved up. He keeps repeating the line about not being a thief and sprinkling in that I'm a racist every once in a while. Somebody must have called security because a security guard walks into the cafeteria and makes a beeline for us. Now it's worth mentioning that the guard and Entitled Dad are the same race. Entitled Dad starts speaking rapid-fire Hindi to the guard. He stops every once in a while, and Entitled Mother nods along with whatever he's saying. I can't understand a damn thing, so I just stand there waiting for my turn to speak. I mean, security is here, so how much longer can this go on? So, you can imagine my shock when the security guard asks me to step aside, not so we can talk, no, so that Entitled Dad and family can leave. 
WTF? Apparently, I was harassing the mother and child. The entitled dad had stepped in, and now I was refusing to let them leave. I tell the security guard as patiently as I can that I was not harassing anybody. I just want my tablet back so I can get back to work. The security guy looks at the kid holding the cartoon character-covered tablet and starts talking to entitled mother and dad again in Hindi. Then he tells me again to move aside so they can leave or else he will be forced to contact the police and restrain me. I'm not sure if it was the security guy's stupidity or entitled dad's smug face. But something did snap in my brain, and I went a bit Karen on the guy. I tell the security guy that I'm happy to comply, but I'm calling his boss, and he is going to be liable for my property being stolen. The entitled family shuffle out the exit, and I start to dial. The security guy was probably thinking he was about to put me in my place because when you dial security, they patch you through to the officer closest to the location, which was him. He already had his phone out ready to give me the I am the manager talk. I bypassed the switchboard completely and phoned his boss directly. The security supervisor is a guy I'm going to call Dave. Dave is an ex-cop. Dave runs a tight ship and Dave does not tolerate stupidity lightly. I say hi to Dave and get to see the security guys. Eyes boggle a little bit. I ask Dave if he's aware that his officers are allowing thieves to leave the hospital while the people they've robbed are detained in the cafeteria. I give him the full rundown of the last 10 minutes with the guard's name sprinkled in there fairly liberally, along with a description of the entitled family. The security guy is losing the color from his face. Dave doesn't waste any time. He has the details confirmed by the guy in the camera room and radios the other guards to stop them at the exit. I hang up with Dave, look at the security guy and ask him if he feels like getting me my goddamn tablet back now. He's off like a shot. I call my manager and let them know the mess I'm dealing with. He laughs and tells me to take my time but keep him updated. Security wind up returning the family to the cafeteria about five minutes later, minus my tablet. I ask what happened to it, and the newly arrived security guys tells me that when confronted, entitled dad took the tablet from his kid and threw it on the ground. Dave has the contents in a plastic bag. The thing is mangled, screen smashed, cases warped, just a total write-off. Dave had wisely chosen to call the police at that point. Entitled Dad had been fairly uncooperative until the word police was spoken. He was still saying that there was no proof the iPod was mine. The guard had bought him back to point out the dozen or so cameras in the cafeteria. He was looking decidedly less smug by the time the cops got there looked at the remains of the tablet, looked at the footage, and issued entitled dad with a fine and a charge for theft and destruction of property. What could have been a quick teachable moment for a kid turned into almost three freaking hours of talking to the cops and getting my case number before I could finally go back to work. Dave filled out an incident report for me, so I still got paid. Dave, you are the MVP. A couple of days later, I got a call from a lawyer who worked for the family that entitled dad was visiting. He arranged for my iPad to be replaced by sending me a check. It was enough for wifey to buy a top-of-the-line replacement and all the peripheral stuff she wanted, so she's happy. I was asked if I would consider writing a letter about the charges against Entitled Dad being a cultural misunderstanding because it could affect future visa applications. I politely declined as I think being a jerk transcends culture so he can live with his actions. Hell, he might even learn something from the experience. The idiot guard wrote a very sincere apology letter and delivered it in person. We shook hands and I consider it resolved. Dave put him on probation and I figure that this is a learning experience for him. Maybe next time he'll hear both sides of the story and then check the cameras. I got myself another Kindle. I'm hoping that the fact it just does books and doesn't look like an iPad will keep the entitled ones away. Wow, this OP's encounter with the entitled Karen and her family is just too much to handle. I can't even imagine how he must have felt in that moment, having his tablet stolen by a little kid and then having to face the craziness of the dad and security guard. The whole situation just spirals out of control, with the dad accusing the OP of being a racist and harassing the mother and child. And then to top it off, the security guard asks the OP to step aside so the family can leave? What kind of world are we living in? I feel so bad for the OP. He was just trying to grab a quiet moment with his book, and now he's facing all this craziness. Can you believe that they were going to get away with it too? Thank goodness the OP had a little bit of revenge. What do you guys think about this absurd situation? Let me know down below. You're too young to use that, just walk! This is a story on how A. Karen demands I get off of my mobility scooter at Costco, claiming it was only for the elderly and disabled, despite my need for it due to my medical condition. Here's what happened when I refused to give in to her entitled demands. So, I developed osteomyelitis and abscess in my right ankle the beginning of last December, and luckily got surgery just in time before any infection reached the bone. Otherwise, it was bye-bye leg from the knee down. Unfortunately, the infection got so bad that it ate away at the tissue in my ankle. Ankle, leaving it almost hollow. 
and my nerves were damaged that I can't rotate my foot around nor curl my toes without pain. I stayed in the hospital for a month, unable to celebrate Christmas, my birthday, or the New Year, but was otherwise okay afterwards. I'm using a walker again and slowly transitioning back to using a cane. Okay, story time. I was supposed to go get groceries on Monday with my dad, but he had gotten home late from work, and as it was almost dark, we didn't go, but decided, okay, going the next day. Next day, he gets home on time, still daylight out, so we head out to Costco to buy some stuff in bulk. Once we arrive at the far end of the parking lot, because, let's face it, the lot is always full. We hope to find a mobility scooter with the attached cart that they keep up near the entrance to the store. There's only about five in total. They really need to get more. Now, I understand some of you might be thinking, those are reserved for the elderly slash disabled slash people who actually need them. And you'd be right. But unfortunately, I can't walk for long periods of time without pain, and the scooter really helps. Believe me, I tried getting around the store just holding onto the cart, but ended up hurting my foot after we left from the stress I put on it, and ended up bedridden again for a couple of days to let it heal. But I always feel bad guilty, as I feel like people are judging me for being so young on the scooter, while my older dad walks along Beside me. Luckily, there was an older woman on a scooter finishing loading her trunk near where we parked, so I asked if I could use the scooter after she was finished. She was lovely and said absolutely, and I helped her load her groceries and assisted her into getting into her car. I thanked her, wished her a wonderful day, and off to the races I go on the scooter. Fast forward. Nothing eventful much as we do our shopping until we start heading to checkout when this woman runs in front of me and I immediately stop to prevent from hitting her, my body whipping forward from the sudden stop and her my stomach. Conversation as follows. You know those are for the elderly. You need to get off and get a cart. I know they're for the elderly and disabled, so you need to get off then. Someone else could... I don't need to do anything. I have trouble walking and that's all you need and get to know. Excuse me. I start to back up to get around her. She suddenly grabs onto the front end of my cart. No, stop! You kids need to learn to stop playing around with sensitive equipment. You're young. Just walk. Quite loudly. Stop! Let go of my cart! A few other customers that were around look our way, and Karen lets go and storms off with an UGH! My dad was a few feet away and about to say something before she walked off, probably just to curse her out. We head off to the checkout and I make some nice conversation about anime with the cashier as he complimented my shirt. It was a Naruto shirt I got for Christmas. Then back out to the parking lot where we meet an older couple coming in. The man asks if we're parked far, as he was in the same predicament we were of acquiring a cart. We said unfortunately so, so his wife told him to wait near the entrance, and she followed my dad and I to our car to get the scooter once we were finished unloading. She helped us unload and also complimented my shirt, and had a talk about how her kid was somehow learning Japanese from watching anime, and how to her it just sounds like complicated Spanish. We finish up, she takes the scooter, we thank each other, and head off our separate ways. Oh, and the entitled woman? Well, dear reader, it just so happened that as I hobbled my way into the passenger seat, I see her and her kids mere feet away unloading her groceries as well, and her own teenage son was driving in circles on a scooter, impeding the flow of cars driving through, trying to find a spot, and he's just dicking around like there's no tomorrow. I'll give her some credit, though, that she was scolding and yelling at him to get off and stop messing around, though didn't physically intervene. We pull out our spot, but unfortunately, she finished up quickly and we were stuck behind her. As we reached the end of the lane, her car just stood there at the stop sign for a good three minutes, not moving. Now a line was starting to form behind us, and my dad and a few others are honking their horns to get her to turn. She doesn't. People lay on their horns, and she finally moves forward. Not the best story, but definitely an experience. I swear some people just want to watch the world burn. Wow, what a crazy story, OP. This entitled woman is something else, right? First off, let me say that I am so grateful you're okay after everything you've gone through with your ankle. That's just crazy, and I can't even imagine what you've gone through. But let's talk about this entitled woman who just ruined your day. First, she tries to tell you that you shouldn't be using the mobility scooter, and then she grabs your cart to try to stop you. I mean, what kind of behavior is that? And then to top it all off, she had the audacity to scold her son for using the scooter, but not actually doing anything to stop him. I'm so glad that you had some nice conversations with the cashier and the older couple who helped you, though. That just goes to show that there are still good people in the world, even if there are some entitled Karens out there.